What follows is an informal chat about Bitcoin in the context of John Nash's theories of sound money and macroeconomic monetary policies. In this conversation are Jal, Yance, Kalkob, Aknix and Shinobi. The content found herein should be taken as open-minded conversation. Cryptocurrency is an emergent topic of research and you're encouraged to carry out your own due diligence. We'd love to get your feedback and any corrections in the comments below. You guys can hear me eating? Shit. You, you sound like you're eating an apple whilst you're talking. I'm eating you could chip. <laughs> so I was wondering when we start talking about Hal's diet. I was wondering <laughs> uh, about this uh, inflation control of the central banks because they control... They try to control prices according to a basket, like um, consumer price index, right? And that's like a basket of like different items and services that uh, a regular person in society needs. But uh, that's not necessarily controlling inflation rate or controlling price levels according to a uh, um, wholesale price index, like where the companies are that the companies are using. And even so, like. It still depends on like what what kind of basket you have, like what um, what resources uh, you're talking about. So, I mean, for one company, it might be the prices might be relatively stable, but for another, they might be totally out of whack. And uh, um, so, th- am I right? Hello. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you're in here because you. That's sort of the extent of my understanding of it. So it's a, a CPI, a, it's a consumer price index, and it's, but it's also determined sort of by the government or the bank. So it, it, it can it's politically corruptible in a way, and it's it's domestic, so it's not necessarily related to the international um, view. And that's that's true as well. That it's uh, totally um, uh, only for one one country at a time, and um, I guess it works kind of well on stuff that's uh, labor intensive. Because for big companies, uh, a big portion, or for companies, a big portion of their costs are is labor, and labor, the cost of labor depends on the cost of living for a regular person, which is reflected more or less in the consumer price index, like. You, I mean, people. You can have your different differences and like exactly how well it's represented, but it's it's represented fairly well. So it's another way of saying the feedback could uh, grossly distort the metric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, sometimes there are other companies that uh, you know they don't have that much uh, labor as a as a part of their input, or you could say that uh, the consumer price index is out of whack, or. Yeah, there are different different things. Like um, there are some companies that are like heavily uh, weighed towards like one uh, one type of good that's just like doesn't follow the consumer price index at all. So that company is going to get fucked from the monetary policy. Well, see, so that's, they... like, that's the huge aspect of this. Like you, you just like fucking describe part of the like the feedback perfectly but like the, the other aspect of it is like the money spigot and the, the inflation targets and the monetary policy and like you know they have to fine tune that perfectly or things deflate because like there's not enough money chasing things or like you know things inflate like crazy because there's a bunch of money chasing shit and like at the end of the day like we have never historically seen any monetary policy like target that perfectly Dang. on a long time time horizon like it's Dang like shit it is fucked like bob not now right now okay and we don't have any good um you, you know like ubi that's a problem like i haven't heard anyone still come up with a good solution for so that's just an extraordinarily hard thing to do so it's like uh, like i said i haven't even heard a remotely good idea for how to do that hold so, on like, hold on you what's ubi universal basic income what does that have to do with this though i'm saying it's related to trying to to fix and tame economic issues like when things get out of control and that's been something that some people have tried to to entertain but i just don't think that i've seen any any kind of way to do that that that's at all reasonable it's just a problem that i don't even know if that that solution could at all work you know 
Okay, so in regard to a domestic CPI, what Nash proposed was an international CPI, or what he called an ICPI, and it gets often misappropriated because people think that he suggested we should peg our world currency to an ICPI. But rather, he showed that an ICPI would work, but it's a politically corruptible solution. Yeah, and that's kind of where I see like Bitcoin tie into things because like it being like just the whole confluence of the incentive structures. You have like the, the limited supply and the speculation over that. And then you have the, the energy input into proof of work chasing that speculative price. And like that naturally finds that equilibrium. And ultimately at the end of the day, like any economic activity requires the input of energy. So proof of work becomes that basic opportunity cost. Like the first thing that you ask yourself when you as an economic actor are expending energy is, is it more profitable to mine Bitcoin and secure this like basket of value or is it more profitable to put that energy somewhere else to get bitcoin through people like purchasing your good or service or whatever and that naturally will find its own equilibrium like that will be the basic like measuring stick of all economic activity that will always at a large enough scale float to that equilibrium like bitcoin effectively emulates that icpi just through the nature of how the incentives and, and the opportunity costs of proof of work work. It, 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 just by it, just just by buying or selling, like if if a good is like a good is good uh, to take that and buy it for Bitcoin or sell it for Bitcoin, depending on what price it is. That's how you regulate the prices, just how they relate what their price is in re uh, relative to Bitcoin. Um. Yes, Satoshi said that the price of any commodity tends towards the cost of production. And that's very relevant because if we could accurately price cost of production, uh, we start to create a, a metric for value. Exactly. And on a long enough time scale, when that speculative price is dragged up high enough, and proof of work is a big enough percentage of global like energy output that finds that point. And then it really does just become like a situation of energy is either going into legitimate economic activity of other sorts, or it's going into securing the Bitcoin network. And there really isn't that like energy to put into undermining like the Bitcoin network, which is like the thing tracking all the other economic activity. So like at a large enough scale, it just finds that point where it's enough to secure like the value recorded by the Bitcoin network versus all the other economic activity it's tracking. And that's the equilibrium. And that will like we nobody like that. That's an ICPI that doesn't have that ability to politically ma or manipulate it because it's just a free floating equilibrium on its own. There, there is no politicization of like handling that index. You know what I mean? I agree. I agree. But I'm going to argue that it's it's only good. It's not ideal. It's not perfect. But it is it is good. Now with gold, no one no one would have agreed with Satoshi back then that the the, the price of gold was going to tend towards the cost of production because the price of gold skyrocketed in relation to that. Because it became a monetary, or it's mon it, it, it was an inflation hedge, right? Well, I think the people playing with gold realized it wasn't the best store of value because you had to take physical delivery, and it ends up, you know, being a kind of a difficult thing to do. Especially mm -hmm. if the rest of society isn't scaling out to match. Like, if banking continued to grow, then like gold would have more physical delivery. It does be a better than this other thing kind of interfering with that to as well you know in the bigger picture gold is depressed by corruption ultimately and that kind of falls into the fear of of you know kind of old nursery rhyme types type stuff you know what i mean it's like uh, people being so badly manipulated for so long see nash makes the point that the it, gold costs more to dig deeper so there's sort of a natural throttle on its supply um and that that's relevant nick zabo 
I uh, wrote about mining the vast deep and about uh, mining comets. And the point that they both sort of make is that technology can make gold not very scarce. There's a big difference, though. Um, no matter how much money you throw into the Bitcoin, uh, like how much money you throw into mining, you will always average a block of about every 10 minutes. And with gold, it's different. Um the more money you throw into it, the faster you could dig and the faster you could extract that gold. And it gives, you know, always an advantage to someone. Uh, whereas in Bitcoin, it doesn't work that way. No, no, hold on, hold on. This is this is the point, though. Because it costs more to dig deeper for gold, so you you would sort of be losing your profits there. So you, you, it's got... You're right, there's a difference in how it gets throttled, but they both have a throttle on their supply. And... and it doesn't matter why, but that they have a similar throttle on their supply makes them a good inflation hedge. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yep. But that Except, goes out the window once space becomes a factor and we start cheap yes. mining there. Yep. Not only that, you also and have also the, the ocean delivery issue. Yes, and the yeah, oceans, so. and yes, and the delivery. Yes, there, there we go. So, so Bitcoin is a better gold. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, pretty much. Except the way that it's structured also allows, you know, it to function not just as a better gold in the economic sense, but also a better gold in the currency sense. Like gold, the gold used to yep. directly be money itself. So it's not only the like the optimized like economic sense in the macro scale, it's the optimized like thing you can actually use as money too. That's what I would tell you. Yeah, I would just accountability. I would just and, tell and them. And then also of, you get there too. I would just tell them, think of a gold bar. You're not going to take a gold bar to a convenience store and scratch off uh, a gram of gold. But that's Bitcoin, the thing. You, you would back in the day, and now we have that thing that that fixes all the big scale fuck ups with gold, and also allows you to directly use it like you would back in the day. Like yeah, they, yeah. People used to use gold dust as money. Like you would drop a, yeah, a fucking yeah. pinch of gold dust on the counter to pay for your beer in a saloon. Fucking nuts. Yeah, well, you know, you, you keep all your gold coins and all the thing from time to time. You're going to get a lot of gold flaking just from having them in your pocket or whatever. You know, and that's what about that seashells? People started noticing too. Seashells wasn't a store of value, right? That was just a way of uh, medium of exchange. Actually, they kind of were for some oh. tribes, I guess. This but is see, all very do, relevant. That, yeah, I mean, that had to do more with what type of seashell, you know, how rare it was, how hard to find those types of seashells and stuff like that. Yeah, true. Yeah, man, seashells makes good money if you really think about it. Yeah, sometimes. You, you might be able to grow more of them. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the real that's, thing. That's one of the... That would be counterfeit. And then you pollute the market, and then people realize it's starting to get undermined at some point, and then the whole entire system ends up failing eventually. It's just a really obscure reference to the fact that I think inflation has to do with uh, the uh, golden ratio and how fast you can grow a shell. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. No, it's funny. Yeah, I don't know if it's you, though. Okay, um, yeah, we went from shells to... um, commodity money with uh, gold coins and uh, you know silver coins and this and that and eventually uh, they started to alloy or mix them with uh, say lead and devalue the coins well yeah, yeah. And, that's and why bitcoin is better board. also tustin yeah, you could you could make you could have thick gold. You could like you know use tustin for that. So, Bitcoin is just a better, just a better way to store money and s- spend money. Yes, yes, yeah, and and they would, would weigh them and or assay the, uh, you know, the metals. And um, this is where Gresham's law came from because the queen was devaluing her money and and her wealth left her kingdom, her queendom, and. And uh, she had to ask her advisors, like, where did my wealth go? Where did my money go? Gresham's Law is, is very relevant here. 
Yeah, and that's like another aspect that like I think is just setting things up for hyper Bitcoinization because, you know, people are going to want to get that better money. They're going to want to take their shitty money and get Bitcoin. OK, so that happens. That's its own feedback loop. OK, people want Bitcoin like they're going to do everything they can to get Bitcoin and, you know, then spend shitty money. But on the same side, like merchants, people selling their services, they're either just going to want Bitcoin because it's the better money or they're going to be taking all of their proceeds with shitty money and just getting more Bitcoin. So that's either going to go one way. You have all the merchants like just wanting Bitcoin and not wanting to take shitty money, or they're just going to become another person like like a consumer where every bit of shitty money they get, they're instantly trying to throw that into Bitcoin. So like either way, that's creating that feedback loop where it's just pushing everything towards Bitcoin and shoving fiat out of the picture. Yes, and now I've got I, I quote the Congressional Research Report on Bitcoin uh, by the U.S. Congress, where explain that, and you're you're, you're it's right in line with it. Um, the velocity of they say if Bitcoin becomes substantially used, the velocity of the U.S. dollar will increase um, because it's like a hot potato thing, and that forces them if they're inflation targeting uh, to rein in their supply. Yeah, I agree. But the question is, like, you know, will they? Because, you know, yeah, yeah Congress yeah. might see that, but, like, our banking system is one of the most fucked, crooked things in the world. So are they actually going to do that? Or are all the people in charge of that just going to go, hey, we're the ones who get this money first. Um, this, we're, we're how it gets out into the greater economy. So why not just take that and buy Bitcoin for ourselves? Yeah, it's got to hit the individual level. That's what I keep saying. It, it, Bitcoin has to hit the individual. Now, when there, there's a rational reason to devalue a dollar of any country, um, which is it helps them sell, expo- it helps them export, right? Like uh, I'm, I'm from Canada. I try not to say anything about me but uh, some people know that anyways uh oil tanks and we have a very oil heavy economy and so we devalue our dollar with oil so that we can export it let's see and that's kind of like the thing like that turns that into a regional issue now not just an issue of individuals in the economy now you're going to have countries that are going to start looking at other countries with uneven yes. positions in yep. Bitcoin, and they're going to start. That's that's the other part of the, the incentives that I think just like naturally pushes things towards hyper Bitcoinization. You're going to have these whole countries playing their monetary policy with the explicit aim just to accumulate more Bitcoin instead of like what they should be doing, which is trying to like fix the, the fucked up incentives for their things. So now instead of having like you, you have all of these like incentives and issues with the individual level, like that are going to push individuals towards exacerbating hyper Bitcoinization. And but you're also going to have those same kind of issues on the level of nation states because all of these nations are going to just see Bitcoin exploding and becoming a huge thing, and they're on a national level going to start playing their economic policies to like actually just get Bitcoin. And it's it's like all the incentives right now, unless all of these global nations start unfucking them at the, the local and national level will just line up at a bigger scale than towards hyper bitcoinization there's yeah so we're if like from another view if 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 the other countries are figure it out and they're like okay we need to like basically what you're saying is every country is trying to procure as much Bitcoin as it can without um, letting the other countries know. Yeah, and that's, the, that's <laughs> kind of where we're at. Is what we're talking. Yeah, like that's I kind of think where we're at like right now in like the early stages of that. These are all sections from Ideal Money talking about like maybe just the individuals, but then looking at it from a, a national view, international view, and, and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Because like, yeah, I mean, like there, there is, 
the, totally the potential for things to like go the way Nash was describing. Like, and it, things would work better that way. Like, as far as like the quality of life for individuals, like the economy, it would, it, we would have something that, that aligned itself properly instead of a big implosion. But all of the incentives right now are lined up just to push things into that big implosion and exacerbate hyper Bitcoinization. But did, okay, so going back to the when the Chinese rumors were that they were banning it, and then the Chinese prices dove, but the rest of the world's prices didn't didn't dive very hard, and it, it came back. So you have an international valuation of this thing, Bitcoin, and now you can see, like, if a currency goes down in relation to it, you can kind of trust that it's it's losing its value you know because there's an in, there's international stability to the price of bitcoin yeah and then like you know the more you see that happen the more people are going to want to shove shit into bitcoin and then it just feeds back into itself and absolutely just absolutely absolutely so so you have um central banks face a, a an exacerbated problem because, because when Bitcoin starts to, when their currency starts to move against it, it's going to move faster and harder because there's a new fairly stable value metric to compare each national currency to. And at the end of the day, you know, I think it's it's more likely uh, they're going to fuck with their monetary policy just to get more Bitcoin than try to like stop that inflationary spiral. Uh, uh, did you mean that uh, it's um, more stable or more fair, I guess, to uh, compare the value of a national currency to Bitcoin rather than to the dollar? Yes, yes, because the, do the dollar has been, you know, you could argue it's somewhat fair, but it, over long term, could you? Yeah, I, I don't think you could. And the this the Triffin dilemma gets brought up. You don't want to be the reserve currency. The U.S. dollar, they are the reserve currency, but they can't devalue for export purposes, and that that creates a, a dilemma for them. Yeah, Which is the why the problem like... with the devaluation is that you it's a currency war, where every country tries to devaluate the devalue the most, and then when Everybody's doing it at the same time. Nobody's devaluing. devaluing. Uh, as, well, it, it, the, the, but the U.S. doesn't feel that way because they can't enter that war. But yes, uh, one of the sections in Ideal Money is called Currencies and Competition. But see, though, once, once Bitcoin gets into the picture, now all of a sudden, though, Jans, you can have everybody devaluing that against some common thing. Yes, the U.S. is going to have to change their role, but yes. And see, like, that's where shit gets wonky, because then now, oh, whoa, everybody can devalue things, and there's the thing to devalue them against, but everybody's going to want to get some of that thing you can devalue it against to protect and hedge against that devaluation. And it's just like all of these things are just like, perfectly lined up exactly to cause hyper bitcoinization and so it's like you know in order to stop that like you have to pretty much get every like macro scale economic actor to pull their heads out of their ass at once now inflation is a is a f hidden form of tax do we all agree on that yes yeah yeah so what we're saying is, I mean, um, I think just financial literacy is what prevents uh, hyper Bitcoinization. Financial illiteracy. Well, to some degrees, yeah. Super being super dumb about money could actually prevent you from from getting uh, from scenario as well. And at a certain degree, a certain spectrum, financial literacy is also going to protect you from from getting thrashed, basically, back and forth. 
I, I didn't say that right in my last question. What I mean is that if if you don't use your government's fiat, they because, don't get. I mean, at a certain point, if you have out of exposure into both, like you're you're probably going to be hunky dory. But I think what he's saying though is like you know it's going to undermine. Like it's a feedback loop where they pretty my, much like don't have tax here. revenue. No, it's like, but like, I think yeah, that's what I meant. Is, I, I, that's what yeah, I meant. you have everybody run into Bitcoin, and because like, okay, that's now anybody there can't be taxed in the overt way. So all there is is the inflationary tax, and that's just another thing driving like inflating more. And yeah, that, that's. I meant fiat is the way they tax us, not not inflation. That that didn't make sense, but um, they, you know, those nefarious governments or malevolent governments, they need us to use their fiat, or they don't get paid. Yep, but nobody's going to want to use it because now there's the alternative. Right. So if but if they keep the value of it fairly stable, then people won't run from it, and so. We see if they're self-interested actors and nefarious players, they'll have to raise the value of fiat in relation. That's the question. Like, how can they do that? Like, okay, normally a central bank would do that by raising interest rates. But my question is, can they afford to? And I mean, can countries afford to? Can the economy afford to? Like, the central bank cannot raise interest rate, it, it rates if it means everybody will go bankrupt. Yeah, so that's well. The that's, way is to to emphasize scarcity in in those markets, which is very difficult to do. But it, it is possible, and and that could that could. It, it is possible. You see, you, you said a meme I have from from John Nash, where he says, it, "After all, it is possible to control inflation by controlling the supply of money." And for a lot of people that even economists, they would think that's just like a five-year-old thing to say, like economics 101. But all of a sudden, that statement becomes incredibly relevant and significant in today's game. Because we've never had this kind of uh, debt, uh, debt ratios that we're seeing right now, where a debt to GDP ratio for most countries... Um, most Western countries, even China, it's uh, like over north of 300%. Like if you combine all, all of the debt in the economy. I think that's, that's relevant. And another point from Ideal Money is that like it can be rational to rush into uh, real estate when your your money's being devalued depending on the interest rates and, and, and this and that, it's sort of making an irrational decision, but um, what way are you going to go? And then so debt increases like very fast and exponentially. It's more about the housing crisis of 2008. Uh, but yeah, that spang on, right? But see, that's kind of people, because like, of the cheap debt that people buy more houses and that creates a more a higher housing prices which makes people buy more houses which uh, you know, makes them take on more debt and you know then yes. eventually it will be totally unsustainable like if you compare um, no because like, there's at a the future moment, at the moment it's not unsustainable too. because the interest the cost the, in, the cost to finance your mortgage is not that high because interest rates are that are so low but if interest rates were to rise like it would be totally unsustainable for most households. There's a plateau there where through self-reflection of your, you're able to kind of realize that you're not able to get that next bigger house or that next bigger property because like, you can't basically afford that right now. Like there's a certain plateau implode. there that is self-actualizing. But that's where things implode because then yeah, the whole, that's, the, yeah, exactly, the whole cycle which is of why like, it's like emphasis of currency shift, changing the future long term perspective, which incentivizes like, based it's on like a better future. It's systemically, you know? though, it's, like, it's pretty we, simple. We had the 08 bubble, okay, that popped, and then you know, everybody got bailed out. But now we're back in another housing bubble. 
Like there's a student loan bubble bigger than that. Like property bubbles are like so retarded right now that you literally have like dirt poor or poor people in that situation over used cars. Like this shit is like at such a, an, a, a fucking close point to that peak of unsustainability. And like now we have Bitcoin looming on the horizon, like just about to create another insane bubble like that. When people realize this Dude, isn't going like away we had and just already. take out the loans and buy Bitcoin. And that's going to be yet another bubble on top of that. I, I mean, I mean, I dude, like in 2000. 2008, I was working in, you know, private fortune five and everyone there knew what was going on. Everyone was kind of just dumb faced, like, holy fuck, the whole world just collapsed and there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, well, might as well get back to work. You know, like how serious could it be with the Internet? Because there's there's social reinforcement. You're able to, like, reach out and touch people and say, hey, well, what do you feel about this? Like, what's the future look like? We're going to get out of this mess or not? You know, a lot of just, you know. They're, they're lazy, but they're not going to give up on that. But it's still, uh, that doesn't, like, we can, you, that's a, a safety net. Like, we'll bounce back from it, but that doesn't mean that, like, it's just not going to be a problem now. Like, it's still, like, the, the overall point I'm making is, like, this is just yet another string of confluences that point towards, like, hyper Dude, I'm, I'm more, I'm actually more worried about pure survival instincts and behavioral uh, health for, over the monetary system at point to be honest well yeah but that's connected to that that's like intricately intertwined with that yeah it's connected but i mean we've taken such large dumps on the monetary system consistently for such a such an extended period of time now i just don't think that we have the same like if we start even if like the news starts announcing some crazy shit about the you know like there's like labor like that thing got uh put out like in three or four different journals and like everyone's just like yeah yeah sure that's the way it works you know like it, it it's it's people want it, it's it's just going to devolve to mental health issues over monetary issues i feel like <laughs> they're very related this is the proper uh point time to point out that uh after the 2008 housing crisis satoshi came out with bitcoin in 2009 right yep it had to be there i mean i i would have i, I would have kind of lost hope in like the, the future from that point you know so because i'm a little bit more cynical than other people i guess but i saw bitcoin and i'm like you know what this this looks like a good idea like this kind of makes sense to, to do because uh, i think that there there's potentially a better future and i for a better future and and german chancellor bails out big bang that was the the crux, right? British Chancellor. Yep. So, looking at the international valuation of money, um, when a money goes down in value, with a national domestic currency goes down in value. We, we don't have this in economics, but the implication is they're not tending to their supply properly. We all kind of agree and understand that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now that we have a competition. So not any other option for a while, you know? Well, there's, I mean, if an economy tanks, Maybe you expect their dollar to go down, but as long as they reflect that in their supply, you could still have stabilization. Um, but now that we have Bitcoin and now that it's all competing on an international level, we have a metric to view this with. But that, that's kind of the whole thing, like the, the way that metric like Bitcoin works and like the whole confluence of like incentives in like the, the legacy economy, monetary policy, like versus Bitcoin and like the way that Bitcoin's incentive structures work. It's like that's this is going to be Gresham's law played out on the most massive scale it ever has. And that's just a, an insane deflation of Bitcoin. And an insane hyperinflation of, of fiat. 
And like the only like the only way to avoid that is like I said, like everybody, everybody in the world just needs to pull their head out of their ass at the exact same time. And like I just I don't really think things are gonna go that way. That that's great. I like you're 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 analyzing it correctly. I just you're that you think that it's not gonna happen like that is uh I think it's wrong. Um but I might be, and in a way, I kind of hope I am. But like, I just, you're observing, I observing exactly. like reinforce through pop culture and everything. Like we're we're heading so far in this direction that like, there's a general vibe around it. Like I think this is the direction everyone is heading, and like we could all shut our laptops and walk away from Bitcoin, and you know, wake up in five years, and and it'd just be bigger. Yeah, I mean, like, how do we stop this? Like, there, there's no way to stop this confluence of events at this point. Just scan your mic, Smuckle. That mic's muffled. Acnix, your mic is muffled. Dude, your mic was muffled. I couldn't hear any of that. Hello? Oops, sorry. Yeah. What did you say though? So, I mean, to a degree, I think people are blind to their own, you know, or, or they've been incentive structures too. Um, there's, there's a lot of weird going on in terms of like, just like wildly inaccurate and stuff like that, that, um, are going to take time to play out as well that again, prevent people from interacting in this back and forth, uh, you know, potential hyper Bitcoinization scenario, just because they have too much mental, mental fuzz. Anyway, they're too clouded actually, um, start shifting on that, making those decisions about essentially now, um, their future, uh, in short order. Like, I just don't see a lot of people doing that. Like people are super cynical now. Like, super cynical. Yeah, and that's just, like, another, like, it's like, you know, I would, I really, really like to see. And I, I think that kind of comes to the, the beaten dog thing, and money is the food, you know? And and and, uh, and talking about Pavlovian psychology, like, I think money has been the, the thing beating people over that for a long time. So they're going to be cynical of any money. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin and it has futures stamped all over it and you know, it doesn't matter. Like everyone's going to have to take their time with these decisions, in my opinion. Well, they're going to be cynical, but they're still going to like, dude. There's like, yeah, there's that cynicism, but like the way people react to money is like, how do I get more? That like, it doesn't matter like how cynical they are. At the end of the day, people need it to take care of their needs, and they will chase what they think can like give them that. And right now, that's. Like, hey, it's staring everybody right in the eye. Like, you got Jamie Damon just screaming, people who buy Bitcoin are idiots. But at the same time, you have the fucking Federal Reserve looking into this shit. You have the fucking People's Bank of China talking about their own cryptocurrency. You have the head of the International Monetary Fund talking about crypto replacing fiat as, like, the fucking reserve mechanism for special drawing rights. I mean, like, it, people can be as cynical as they want. This is just going to fucking dangle in their face until they start jumping at it. Hey, Jamie DeMond has to say that because everyone's at, all his customers are asking him about it and probably his, what he, his business or whatever can't, what he oversees can't invest in it. And secretly he's doing it on the side. So he said, I'll, I'm, I'm done talking about it. But he's still talking about it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like that's another aspect of like I mean, you know when I look around at no, these at no, like no, the no. news, like dude, all of like all of these people, like at such massive levels, like it's so divided. Like no, this is look look at this. This is going to do something. It's a serious thing. Like we're going to have to integrate this. But at the same time, you have all these people like this is stupid. This is a bubble. This is a scam. 
well, look at all the people calling it out as like a bubble or a scam or calling Bitcoiners idiots. Like those are all the people who would be trying to pile in hand over fist and accumulate for their own interest, as opposed to the people who are just not really in the economy in a way where the, their main goal is self profit. It's more just to step back and try to stop everything from imploding. And it's all the people whose job is to step back and stop things from imploding that are taking it seriously. And it's all the people whose role is like mostly just self-interest and self-profit that are like shit talking this and going like, oh, it's just a bubble or this won't work. Like I can already, you can already see the incentives are aligning for all of these big players to jump in and just try to accumulate as much for themselves as they can. No, there's, yeah, there's but I mean, great- there's, there's the, there's a high level of cynicism. I, I I was trying to make a point about Pavlovian psychology and money is dog over the head. You know, it used to be the reward, but instead it's the abuser. You know that, that it's such a perception shift from you know and and recently over over the past like ten twenty years that's been like even more vehemently enforced. Shinobi, I just want to add a little bit to your point about. Um that uh the people who are like trying to uh, keep the system together like they're the ones who are like actually you know taking bitcoin seriously well uh not only is it the imf who's doing that but also the central bank of finland they call the bitcoin revolutionary yeah and it's like it's like things would work so much better if we didn't have hyper bitcoinization if it wasn't a gigantic system shock all at once it was more just a slow everything falling into equilibrium with it but everything is just set up for that giant system shock well if see like the I fed think we're ever getting US- it. i think there's too much cynicism you know that i'm going to remain skeptical as shit you know like it just one little fucking, you know, couple little issues and like people are running away from it again. There's always going to be drama in this space. There's always, you know, we're, we got to keep upgrading and, and making Bitcoin better, you know? So like, holy shit, right? You know, that doesn't really stop. Like there's always going to be reasons to reevaluate fiat on the other side. And just on top of it, like, dude, people are super cynical of money. They really are. Hi. Just thought I would say one thing. Jamie Dimon's just been called out by Bloomberg TV. He said he would never talk about Bitcoin again, and it lasted one day. I'm going to post the the link to it up on... I'll maybe post it to uh, Shinobi's Twitter account, and you can talk about it. Right on. No, that's, that's completely irrelevant. Like, even to cut in with that, uh, there was another CEO of a hedge fund that said something, and I'm like... He's going to rescind this within a day. But I put like in an hour. Um, yeah. He he can't tell his customers like they're asking about Bitcoin. He can't sell it to them. And so like he's, they're just stuck. It's amazing. Yeah, like if you watch the video, he says, I don't care less about Bitcoin. But then goes on to talk about how great the blockchain is and how the only thing he cares about is fiat digital currencies it's a great joke he's obviously talking about it and thinking about it all day long like it's obvious yeah it really pisses him off like shinobi check it out there it's, it's hilarious Oh, you just ping me on Twitter or what? Yeah, I just pinged you on Twitter for it. Guys, I apologize. They keep getting booted, and I, I keep trying to go to talk here. It's cutting me off and stuff. It's probably missing, like, huge parts of the conversation. I can hear anyone talking. Shinobi probably booting you out of the conversation all the time. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's probably famous. You did say something about bigger blocks earlier on. Ah, oh, fuck. If it wasn't for Thamos, you guys wouldn't know about um, Nash's guys. argument and ideal money. <laughs> our Bitcoin, our Bitcoin under Thamos's moderation, 
is uh, the only forum or social site on the internet that hasn't banned me. Seriously? Thamos uh, protected my argument. Clearly. Yeah, I just, I just don't get it. Like, it's just crazy. This whole scene is mad. So, like, hype, in Venezuela, their currency is hyperinflating or very near it. Um, and we might argue that that will change because their people are learning about Bitcoin en masse. Uh, some people say they might adopt Bitcoin as a currency, which I think is sort of impossible and silly. But um, like, what happens with a currency that is um, has price stabilization, international price stabilization versus Bitcoin? What would we say about that? Well, I mean, that's kind of the like that's. The thing, like, even if you do see, like, all these monetary policies, like, there's there's really two options. Like, you know, Jens was saying, you can't really raise interest rates to try and fucking do things in a more organic way. So that really forces, like, insane socialism and planned economies in response to this. And, like, that's not sustainable in itself. So, I mean, like... You know what? What do you what do you do there to that's really try and here, stop though. that? Like that's already here, though. Largely, what do you think the S and P is? It's like it's like a socialized like gambling site. Is that standard and poor S and P? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that all has relation to the value of like say the US dollar too right crashes the NSMP it's going to go up in value yeah probably so uh, where is our so where is our metric where if something goes down and something goes up like just in relation to each other no oh, stuff in the volatility index I don't in like gold can go down like crazy, but maybe just the U.S. dollar is going up. Where's our value metric? Where's the barometer? In my opinion, it's 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 a mix. Like you can pick different things to what's going nice from time to time. The the there's. If some, if you let a government pick the mix, they might corrupt it. But this is where you get back to Nash's CPI. I mean, there must be some optimal basket, and then we could value everything in relation to it. Is that yeah, agreeable? I, mean, I, I think Bitcoin I, might eventually be that thing, but you know. Sorry, you said Bitcoin might be be that thing. Yeah, at some point, that, that you know that kind of starts flipping on their head a little bit so there there has to be a whole entire you know time allotment for perception shift and we're like 10 years in and maybe we need another 10 absolutely but we you guys didn't really like this but in a world of uh where the national currencies are very volatile it is worth more because you can inflation hedge on them but if all the currencies weren't volatile at all bitcoin wouldn't be as valuable because you don't need an inflation edge. Yeah, but uh, the whole thing is like I don't. I'm not, like, not convinced it's, that it's possible. That's why to... I don't see hyper Bitcoinization as a. I was much more worried uh, three, four years ago about hyper Bitcoinization than I am now. Now I'm like, yeah, I think this might actually work out really well the way things have been going. But dude, like the only other option is negative interest rates and negative interest rates is like demonetizing cash. Like people will flee from that shit. Don't work. They will run in mass. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. So that will so push, the way is push the... more people into into Bitcoin, yeah, if anything. Negative already, interest rates. Yep. There's already 
or places with negative interest rates. Japan. And Japan's going insanely into Bitcoin at a national level, full on legalizing it. Like they they've already issued like a corporate bond denominated in Bitcoin. Like they're going like as as a country, they're going full into Bitcoin as like one of the only countries out there with negative interest rates that were pushed into negative interest rates just because of all these systemic economic problems. And more so than Japan. Japan has one of like at negative, it's zero point one. Sweden is zero point seven five negative. All right, Sweden is zero point negative uh, seven five negative. So way more than Japan. How does that actually play out, Bill, in the actual economy? Like, are, are they getting negative interest rates when they put their money into the account bank? Like, are they having to pay for it? I'm sorry, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, no, so you put money into a bank, yeah, you Sweden, pay. Isn't it? In Swiss, like, is Swiss, or Swiss. Switzerland? Switzerland. Okay, this is uh, this is very relevant. So, like, I'm sorry, but I'm going to bring it again. But I don't know if you guys know, but when Nash had his, his revelations, when he lost his mind, he fled the U.S. to Switzerland to exchange his U.S. dollar for the Swiss franc because he's seen it as having a higher value. And then the U.S. Navy tracked him down and took him back in chains. So, like, I knew this is kind of like, yeah. So, yes. And, yes, this is, yes. And their central bank has already... It was in, like, it it was, like, in 54 or 50, but... um, he he had this insight that we're sort of discovering now that um, you know we could have stable. Their central bank has a very similar policy as Japan. They buy stocks outright. Dude, I don't, I don't know, know if we could have had. I don't know if we could have had it back then, though. I really don't. I think he was like totally Cassandra. No, we couldn't. I don't know what Cassandra effect is. Is that I'd like a link to that, but we couldn't. Um, he also developed a decentralized computing system and sent it to Rand. What? This is what I'm trying to tell you guys about. Yeah, dude, like Nash, like he pretty much laid out like um, like most of modern day computing architecture in like the 50s. And he showed that, that before he died. Here's see. Yeah. He he showed that he wrote the NSA and the NSA released this paper um, that he sent them. He showed that encryption will beat decryption, and so that eventually you won't be able like decryption teams will be a thing of the past. But it's it's very hard to understand. But what that means is encrypt encryption can store value. It, me, it means math can store value, and I don't think. People understand why he was so excited about that discovery. Can you explain that a wee bit? That yeah. actually means it's like, okay, imagine I have to hide something from you, but you're a good lock. So I put a lock on it, and you pick it in like ten minutes. But what if I put two locks on it? It'll take you uh, twenty minutes. Or I could put another lock on it. It's you're just adding zeros to numbers, so encryption is stronger than decryption. And he wrote the NSA, and it's an amazing. I've written on this, and if you if you're interested and you don't know about, you should read what I showed because um, he he wrote the NSA and he was in frantic, like he was underlining it, he was handwriting it, and he showed that encryption wins. and like, if you watch the Hollywood movie about him, he, there's a scene where he's in and she's like, the government never received these letters. You're just crazy. And she's trying to show that him that he's crazy. But they they definitely received those letters. He was right. And uh, the NSA released those letters uh, sort of recently, like in the last 10 or 20 years. But uh, it's his breakable encryption conjecture. 
Nice one. Any links? Have you any links? Stick them up. Be great to look up. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I do. I'll try and get them. But um, when 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 did we achieve unbreakable encryption? Does so? Does anyone know? Everything was hackable until Bitcoin, and then once well, Bitcoin came out, well, you can't hack it. It's unbreakable. Well, I mean, it's like it's, it's everything is hackable, but like you know, it's that comes down to like what is hackable like it's the the information and really the only way you can fuck with bitcoin is to take down an entire peer-to-peer network and i mean look at how well that worked with fucking BitTorrent. It, it didn't work like you know things like tor like you cannot just collapse entire networks like that and then when it comes down to like you know you can't take the whole network down okay well then how can you fuck with it you steal people's shit on it but if people are managing their keys properly that's impossible I mean, like, dude, you can generate a Bitcoin key by hand with paper and some dice. Like, that's not ever going to touch a computer. It's physically impossible for it to be hacked. Like, uh, if as long as, like, a, a something like a ledger or a treasure is a genuine, like, device, it's not something that you got, like, man in the middle when you bought it, that's unhackable. Like, nobody can get the keys off of that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's as long as users can manage their keys, it doesn't matter that their computer is completely hackable because you're not going to get their Bitcoin keys when you hack their computer. Yeah, but hold on. We're talking about 1950 when we were just coming up. We, crypt, cryptography was just being born, and he realized that uh, encryption exponentially outraces decryption. So it's way easier to encrypt than it is to decrypt yeah i think he was making more of a an observation though about like um a different forms of encryption than what bitcoin uses because bitcoin really only has like the public key pair to like describe ownership of something and then it's just hashing things like it's not the same kind of encryption as like pgp where you're actually like obscuring a whole bunch of data and hiding that and i mean in that respect like that just I think was a more general comment about like the intelligence community and the fact that one day they're not going to be able to just kind of poke into everything like they could, you know what I mean? They won't have enough time to sift through everything and, and crack everything. And like, they can only see the little bits that they're able to do that for. That the implication there is that uh, encryption can store value. Yeah, that's a little bit of where that insight came from, but I think he was making that that was more like a small point within a larger point that he was trying to make with that specific comment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um he does have he does have a point because I mean, if you have a passphrase or if you're using, you know, BIP38, you are encrypting that seed. So there is some encryption within Bitcoin. Well, yeah, but most it's of it isn't of really that that form of it, you know what I mean? I'm I'm learning I'm learning from you guys here. I've I've never understood that view. I get that. So there the the other major breakthrough he had at that time was uh the bargaining problem in which you observe two parties uh bargaining and he says, "Oh, they have a pocket knife, a baseball, a glove, you know, a few items and you can look you can do the math on the value of the trade without money and then with money. And then he showed that when you introduce money, you can, more trade can happen. And it's like, if I'm going to trade you a truck for a car, the truck might be worth more. I can't cut the truck in half, but if we can have money in the scenario, um, we can make the trade happen and without, yeah, right. With wrecking things. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, you know, why I think like that's where his entire notion of like sound money and like all that came from, because like he really boiled down what money is to the simplest aspects and then realized, well, the way it works now is completely manipulatable. So while you do get the benefit of like that, that efficiency in trade, it can be wildly gamed by whoever is holding the reins of like whatever money they need. Absolutely, and it's shortly before he fled to uh, Switzerland. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, like, you know, not, know to, get, not to get, not to get, like, uh, super deep. Work, right? Right? I, I, we don't know about Satoshi, but uh, Hal Finney was, we we know he was. Yeah, and, like, but, like, Hal, you know, it's not to get super tinfoil, but, like, I didn't know that. God damn it, Huddle. But like, not not to get like super tinfoil, but like something that's always really like weirded me out about Nash is like his, his entire like uh like paper and hypothesizing was like the the whole toll booth problem, and then like he literally died crashing in a cab by a bridge toll booth. Like you know what I mean. I've been called a conspiracy theorist a lot, but I never went off on that. But the very first paragraph from the original Ideal Money is um, about the Turnpike toll booth, which, uh, yes, he died on. And like that's you know it's like ha- like I think like like you said like you you say this a lot you know it's like Nash's sound money is the root of what like this all is but it's just like how do you tie all of this in because i mean not only is it an issue of like do people i don't think most people really get the macro scale issues going on here like that you have to get them over that whole curve to really start having these conversations and then on top of it i mean like you know like i just said like it's you know i i would like to see things go Nash's way. I would like to see Bitcoin as something that explodes in size and draws everything else into a healthy equilibrium and does not implode things. But I just don't see things going that way right now. And like aside from all like the the issues as far as lack of education, I mean like Bitcoin is full of fanatics. I mean like I myself am a, a fanatic in, in a way. And like the minute you try to start having these conversations you start trying to go, well, um, like, what can Bitcoin do in a way that still puts it as a, a big global asset that, it, like, makes the, the overall economy more healthy instead of just gobbling it up? And, like, people are just going to, like, if, if you don't have all that informational basis and, like, background and really get people into the conversation in a context where they understand what's being discussed, then I'm also worried that a lot of people are just going to hear, oh, you want to kill Bitcoin, nah, 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 and then just, like, lash out as if, like, trying to have this conversation and trying to push things towards a more healthy equilibrium instead of just like run head first into hyper bitcoinization is going to be perceived by a lot of bitcoiners as like trying to attack or undermine bitcoin absolutely absolutely so it's and, like well, i think bitcoin actually kind of naturally float so kind of as as you would have have the those people who want to get into it, it's already elevating a little bit more than they expected it to, and they're reevaluating their decision. That class I can't get involved in. Too far out of my reach now at this point. And I, I think like a lot of people are naturally going to, you know, not even try to get into it. That's a good, that, that, that's perfectly on point. That's going to be an unpopular view. You're, you're kind of right. And there is a, a paragraph in Ideal Money that talks about how, like, even though a certain money might be out of the hands of the the general population, it still might serve them. It still might help them, uh, but they might not be able to use it. And that's, you know, in contrast to the big blocker via. Well, yeah, it's like, you know, it's... Like, Bitcoin is definitely on a fucking path to just demolish everything in the process of eating everyone's lunch. And, you know, yeah, everybody in Bitcoin (laughs) is going to make... It it, it really is, dude. And, like, everybody in Bitcoin or who gets in before the very top is going to make out like a bandit. But, like... It's going to be I, a destructive like, creative process. I feel whereas if we go Shinobi, the other I way, feel like, we can do it without that like destructive aspect of it, and still. I think, feel like I would have more bitcoins yeah. then, but I, I don't. I, I like just enough, you know. Like I don't feel like, <laughs> like I don't feel like, uh, 
like there's such the incentive that like I feel like I'm very comfortable and that uh, like basically the way I'm handling things is going to work well for a while. And you know, I I, I don't really see the rush. Um, there, like I I see that the adoption oh, will happen, saying. but I just see like it kind of just clicking on, you know. Dude, I see an on ramp that yeah. is ready Coin to has launch a lot, lot of measures built up. into it. So, it, let's look at a money that is stable in relation to Bitcoin versus a money that's not stable in relation to Bitcoin. And so, this isn't just how it's printed in relation to Bitcoin, it's about how the international markets view. The Venezuelan dollar, the U.S. dollar, the the Swiss dollar. Um, what happens when the markets see the Swiss dollar is not worth as much, so it, it goes down in price, or they see another dollar that's worthy, so it doesn't it stays the same in relation to Bitcoin. So, John, uh, well, yeah, I think a, I had a quick question. Like, why didn't you see us? Um possible or realistic for Venezuela as a country to adopt Bitcoin? This is the, this is very, thank you. Like, it's a good question. It's very innocent, but it it's very controversial. And the reason is because Bitcoin can't scale to be highly transacted. With Lightning, it can. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Yeah, that, 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 right, right. It's slightly different. That's slightly I different. I still agree right. with you, though. And, and look, look, look I, I think BTC naturally uh, attracts pegging. Not necessarily a hard peg, but a nice dynamic floating peg. And I think this is a natural concept. Coupling and decoupling from nations that need Bitcoin the most. And I think one one area we're actually getting an eventual equalization of in fact, is Venezuela, for example. They're, they're suffering because oil, they were an oil heavy, heavy economy, I think, weren't they? Yeah, they yep. have the largest oil reserves in the world. Yeah, and, and that's, and that's, oil had a large monetary uh, component from, uh, as an inflation hedge, and so does gold, and that changed. Really there was fast. a double whammy. Hugo, Hugo Chavez died too. So oil collapsed and the government yep. collapsed. Wait, yeah, when yeah, Chavez yeah. must have died a long time ago. But in context, you know, it kind of all lines up that, like, the 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 if you say that what they experienced wouldn't have been as bad. I mean, Chavez it, died in two thousand thirteen. Not... Okay. 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 But like it's you know like, like I said yeah like I very things very much could go the the way that Nash described in a much more like healthy direction while while still seeing Bitcoin become a a huge like global like asset or currency but I just don't see things lined up that way I mean they could be lined up that way like things could be like realigned like unfucked. But right now, everything is just totally lined up to go the exact opposite way. Like I, I like the, for looking at things right now, I just see the tracks towards hyper Bitcoinization being laid out in, like by the day. No, we're getting we're getting to something. So 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 Venezuela, let's say their economy tanks, but they could choose to rein in their supply with that because that's that's what you should do if you want a more stable money. Right. If your economy is expanding, as I understand, you can expand your money supply. But if it's contracting, you need to contract your money supply. It, right. But they're doing the exact opposite. And it's like there was Venezuela in specific, like they're doing it the exact opposite way because of like change. the entire way their economy is structured. Like they don't really have yeah. a domestic economy. 
they are oil producers. Like they were a socialist government that just like nationalized oil production, exported and sold oil, and then just paid for everything with that. And now oil went down. Hey, that just blew up in their face. And they're just rapidly printing money to still be able to afford to do shit domestically. I mean, like they right, could not, like a couple months ago, they literally could not even afford to buy new cash bills from like some of the companies that print bills for like central banks. Like they, they couldn't even afford to inflate the money supply with cash. But that's and oil tanks and they need to export and, and they devalue their dollar. And But that's a consequence of the global system. That's not them as a direct, thing and and they've taken money it from really the world bank and stuff like that for economic development they... they have loan policies and all this kind of other stuff which conflates the issues so like we really need to look at this absolutely like, you know a little bit down a few levels down you know but it is it is related because those those down to international where, down to issues where. would not have affected them this way and caused this series of events if they hadn't structured their local national I would argue issues they would. so poorly like if they had a healthy domestic economy, if they, they would, actually anyway. produced things in Venezuela, actually had like economic activity on a local level, this would not be anywhere near as bad. But they didn't. Agreed, agreed. But when your economy's tank, how do you produce? And like, if you don't have anything to produce, they have oil, and that's the whole fucking problem, right? Yeah. Yep. So they might get it. They might get into Bitcoin. That's what we're saying. They might have some programmers come out of there that are um, quite uh, fueled. It's uh, actually uh, if you look at um, a podcast called uh, John Seth's World, uh, the second to last episode is an interview with a guy from Venezuela, and they spend about an hour going pretty much in depth on the in in depth uh, on the situation there. Um, it's very interesting, specifically them. But yeah, with the with the lightning, I mean, it's very interesting to see uh, to look at you know Bitcoin as um, you know a whole country opting Bitcoin as a currency, and um, because it's actually possible. Right, 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 right. And yeah, so that, and that's related to Gresham's law because lightning, that's, it's perfect. Lightning is perfectly pegged to Bitcoin. That, that's kind of what Shinobi was pointing at too. It, it's perfectly pegged. Yeah, and like you can do any number of like second layer systems that are pegged in a way where you can't just cheat things. You can't inflate it beyond like the terms of what you pegged it to because when you do, it's immediately obvious. Like there is no opportunity to just like inflate the money supply and like play shell games and hide it. It's like, no, it's all right there on some chain somewhere, like auditable, like snap to anybody who wants to right so we can call that honest money perfectly honest and this relates back to um the gold that we ended up putting lead into and slowly devaluing it and the king wanted to know why her wealth had led, left the kingdom right um it's one to one and you can make it not one to one but it's it is what it says it is, and you can verify that perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, ultimately, even if you do not do one to one peggings, that work can kind of be like a. Sorry, did you just kind of cut in? I think you liked. But, like, you know, even if it's, like, not a direct one-to-one -one peg, well, I still think that, like, it'll find its valuation to where, in the economic sense, it is a one-to-one -one peg. Because it's just, like, the, the market will just do its thing. That's the point. That's it right there. 
So the market will tell you what it's worth perfectly. Mm -hmm. And if you're a liar, the market will reflect that. Exactly. And so like, it's, it's like, it really just protects against all of the kinds of games being played with the economy. Historically, we haven't had that ability. The markets didn't necessarily reflect that. What you needed was an international e-currency with a stable supply that could give you a metric or barometer to judge um, value versus. And it's going to be Bitcoin. And I mean, like, really, like, I, I think we're in a complete agreement about that. It's just a matter of, like, are all of these central banks and national economies going to pull their heads out of their ass and, like, find a way to come up with sensible monetary policies in that landscape? Or is Bitcoin... No, 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 no. Please, I, I, I don't always cut in. Allow me to cut in. Yeah. Look at, look at it the other way. No, no, not sensible, not cooperative, not benevolent. Their malevolent nature, their self-interested nature is going to force them to compete. And because of that, they're going to get better and better. And what is the best money? The best money is the most honest money. The money that you know what it's going to do and what its value is and that creates a metric and we've never had that metric our metric for value has been distorted politically and we're about to see a stable metric value uh, for all time and so what kind of money will the markets valuate the highest what is the most important to us? That's a stable metric of value of all time. Yeah, but like, you know, if again, like I said, it's that malevolent interest very well could just lead to them not trying to make like their currencies honest to compete with that. It could just be like, let's fucking ruin these just to you're, accumulate as much of that doesn't Dude, serve shinobi, shinobi your argument right now shinobi your argument right now makes me want to like plan fiat like you know kind of scarcity <laughs> like basically had a reel in dollars <laughs> you know because like it, it just kind of you know what i mean the incentives are there like you know but they're not aligned to make it better to make it better because they don't want to lose their job they don't yeah, want to lose their customers yeah. And this is what Nash talks about. He says they don't want to lose their customers. Um, they're going to have advisors, and their advisors are going to not want to be wrong. Um, so we're watching this with, like, you know, China. Say China's banning Bitcoin, China's banning Bitcoin. I'm like, this is fake news because there's no fucking way in hell that the Chinese government – Chinese government isn't stupid. Does anyone here think that Chinese intelligent agencies are dumb? Um, yeah. No, come on. Kind of, what? Like, Are you kidding dude, me? I really do. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I really do. And this is not oh, just me dude. talking you out of my the, ass. You think like, the Chinese dude, version of the NFA is dumb? Yes, I do. Like, they have literally, okay, like China in one city, and this is coming from a buddy of mine living in China. They spent almost $100 million putting up sensors all along the city streets to grab the fucking MAC addresses off a of phone. Like a MAC address, if you don't know, it's like a physical identifying thing okay, for okay. phones. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now almost all modern phones nowadays, until they actually connect to a network, like when they're just passively like bouncing around going like what networks are around, here's who I am, they scramble their MAC addresses. They don't broadcast their real MAC addresses. They just like constantly make random ones and shoot those out there until they actually like connect to a network. And then they go, okay, here's my real one. The Chinese government spent $100 million installing that surveillance system that's completely useless. And they didn't even realize it until they fucking put it up there. 
Well, maybe like, it was for economic development, Shinobi. Governments maybe are Maybe that was for economic development. No, it maybe, wasn't. Maybe what that was just... they did that to track people, explicitly to track I people. I think it's And more they than set that. it up in a way that's totally useless. Like, the thing it's doing to try to track people is totally useless. They literally wasted $100 million to track people in a way that doesn't work. And they didn't realize it until they actually did it. Like, governments are incompetent as fuck. Dude, big, dude, this is a problem with all big organizations. Like some of that's it's like subconscious will. It's like here we're producing these chips that do facial recognition on hardware and stuff, you know? So like it kind of makes sense at a certain point to indoctrinate that into the system and to try and, yeah, like, but, like, you yeah, know, explain they, they that do away. They thing that works and doesn't the mean total that they're GDP, incompetent. Right? Like, that the kind of structure to support something, even if it's a bad project, which is kind of the overall downwards that like a, a lot of nations are taking. Dude, you're missing the point. Like, they literally spent $100 million that anybody who knew anything so, about how cell phones work would have immediately went, that's a waste of money. But they did it anyway because, like, it's an, an inefficient bureaucratic structure. Most of the people in it, especially the people making decisions, are morons. I would say they're more lazy than morons. No, that, that's just – that's not laziness. That is straight stupidity. They dumped $100 million into something to track their population that is completely and utterly ineffectual in any level. $100 million U.S. dollars? Yeah, valuation. Yeah, that's nothing. Dollars. Dude, you're missing the point because the, the whole point isn't just about the monetary that, that could value. Be... It's that they did something that it, they, they chose a – insane degree of incompetence in what they're doing yeah but i mean that's that's shinobi that's something that happens in all big organizations yes but, uh, which is kind know. of like my point what i'm trying to make is they're not going to make the right intelligent calls unless everybody pulls their head out of their ass at the same time i i i that's a higher level point, and we'll leave that. But there's a lower level point that no, they're gonna do this selfish thing, and they're not gonna let their cost. They're not gonna lose all their customers, and that's what will happen if they hyperinflate their currencies. They'll lose all their customers, and customers is a word from Nash's ideal money. He, you know that that's a metaphor. So, but I but there's there's a higher level point that you're saying. But on a really basic level, no, no central bank will lose all their customers out of hyperinflation. But I mean, it's so, happened Joe, so Joe, many Joe, times how, how in history, gonna... Joe. And like, dude, it's this is again, like this kind of draws back to what I was saying about like social cohesion. Like everything is an incentive structure. And once those incentive structures falls apart, they don't work anymore. You can't expect everybody to act in the interest of the, whatever unit they're a part of. It's good that social structure will decohese and then it becomes every man for themselves. And once so it gets to that point, they're not going to give a shit about losing their customers. It's as individuals, how do I make out ahead? How do I come out ahead? How do I like get the few like semblances of that social cohesive network that I still have connections to, to, to benefit myself. It stops becoming about like the, the units. It becomes about the individuals and the individuals at that point are acting solely for their personal benefit. So pretend that the government can block Bitcoin, like just pretend they can. Do you think China would block their citizens from having it or not block them from having it? Yes, I think if it was at all possible to actually like block Bitcoin to shut Bitcoin down, it would be done in a heartbeat. And it's not being done because there's they can't. No, 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 no. I'm talking about just China knowing that the rest of the world is, is getting Bitcoin. China government do if they could block it, would they allow the allow their citizens to have it or not? 
No, and they're already moving in that direction. That's like the point. Like they realize they can't shut the whole thing down and everybody else is like it's a game theory thing. Like I could shut it down for me, but then I like I'm going to lose because the other guy won't because he sees an opportunity to gain there. And so that yes. sets up that equilibrium where no one's going to shut it down. Then the, the moves they're making now are just like, yes, okay, yes, how yes. do we how do we cut the common people out of it so it's just us at the top benefiting from it? And that's the phase we're in right now. That that makes it worth way more than five thousand dollars a coin. Yeah, way more. And like that's my point. And then once that happens, and like people go, "Oh, I need to get in," like they're they can't shut everybody out. There's too many holders. Like there's too many people Play. out there who are going to be like, oh, I'll sell a little bit here because fuck it. I am insanely wealthy now. Yeah, here, give me some fiat that I can use to go do stuff. And like, here, there you go. Or like, I'm going to buy property with this. Here, take some of that. And there's nothing they can do at this point to stop that fucking spreading. All they can do is slow it down by locking down the actual like exchange markets. But that doesn't prevent people from just going and trading or setting up decentralized marketplaces that they can't shut down. Like, the, it's, no, it all it's doing is delaying the inevitable. The, and the whole thing yeah. is like, okay, so if fair, the fair value of Bitcoin right now is maybe like an order of magnitude higher than the price already is. So that's that means like the, the fair value is maybe like $50,000. And if it actually, so when it goes to fifty thousand dollars, you know, then the fair value is actually going to be a lot higher because then people are going to see that you know, holy shit, this is going up. So we need to actually buy this, and that's going to make it more likely to be successful as as money. And that reduces the money that the government takes in regard to taxes. Equity and capital, that's what I really mean, but we understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah. But then that's kind of like the thing. Now you it this is goes back to kind of what I was saying about Gresham Law at a scale. Like everybody's gonna want to get their hands on Bitcoin and they're going to burn all their fiat, take out all and max out all their credit lines to do that. But then on like the the receiving end of the economy, not people spending, but receiving shit, they're gonna want to fucking get like the good money too. They're not gonna want to take the shit fiat. Like even governments at the end of the day eventually are going to start looking at like accepting taxes in Bitcoin because they're going to want they even they will want the good money in, in in the like process of taxation instead of like debased fiat. Yeah, but they could make their money the, the fiat a little stronger in value too, and then the phenomenon wouldn't be uh, so intense. Now, please explain to me how they're going to make the fiat stronger in value. You explain. The debt value is so high. Dude, rebasing. You rebase it. Go on. Which, which means introducing scarcity again and gaining accountability and then, you know, doing audits and, and publicly posting the audits. And here, like, scarcity is it has improved by this much, right? And add the metrics and then. You know, it, the the money is self-explanatory. When the value is there, like, it, it's self-evident. Like, you, you just need to prove it and be honest about actually reeling in uh, and increasing scarcity, reeling in the number of bills out there, reeling in the digital currency a little bit. Uh, the USD is, like, percent or 70%, like, digital anyway. So, like, reeling in a lot of that stuff is, is, is how we gain that accountability, which then lends to scarcity. And then we're actually able to view what this we're, we're actually able to look at it uh, instead of a never ending brocot tree that just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding where we can't measure it because it's constantly expanding we we now have an ability to measure it because it's on the shrinking end we've never gotten to the ability with us dollars where it's not growing and and more recently it's been growing faster and faster so that means value is getting further and further out of check so we have to act you know, so so that's part of the issue, and and we don't want to do negative interest rates because that's essentially like lighting the tiki torches and and firing off the mobs. So you know, like at a certain point, like we have to start turning to Bitcoin. But like this is kind of my point. Like this is just all naturally heading towards hyper Bitcoinization. It's just a matter of how long the inevitable no. gets delayed. 
No. No, 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 no. no. You, hold on, hold on. It can keep growing. That was great. That whole rant was great. It really was. It can keep growing, though, as long as the underlying economy keeps growing. And it, it, we're hoping it matches in relation to it, right? Yeah, I agree with that. But there's a lot of false value there. There's a lot of value, I believe, that is fake in the market. But, but like, guys, how do you, like, dude, it's like, it's there's there. two ways that you can draw, like, fiat in line with Bitcoin. Negative interest rates, which will just accelerate the hyper Bitcoinization as people flee from all of these fucking currencies. This isn't a binary and, and thing, raising Shinobi, interest this rates, is not binary. Or raising interest rates to disincentivize that rate of inflation. Don't which pigeonhole me, bro. Everybody. Don't pigeonhole me. I'm sorry, I got it because that's the, that's what I see. Where do we com- where, where do we compare those interest rates to? What 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 happens if you target a zero percent interest rate? But like, how like, dude? Then then, what's the incentive for loans? Like, you know, it's that's the the thing. If you target zero inflation, well, then what what's the the economy going to do here? Like that's like like there's no way to avoid like that that shock of just like debt fueled growth can't continue contraction and just the shit show that will be. No, no, it's a perfect question. We're we're addressing a different problem. Um, the the subtitle is the motivations of savings and thrift, and that is like sort of like savings and loans. Like, why do we loan? money and why do we not the 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 muslims don't loan at usury why does western society not like that well because then what's the incentive like now all of a sudden like you know you make that that decision to loan at at an interest rate because it's economically beneficial because we have all of these systems set up where it's like okay you know, there's some degree of enforcement there for that and they make money off of it. But when it comes down to like, you're not making anything off of it, or if these, these institutions don't go negative interest rates to like get the inflation under control, then why would anybody loan money? Like, why would I loan money to you for something when I could just take that money and do what you're going to do with it? Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's no matter, like the whole thing here is like, no matter what, loans are only facilitated in the way they are because of that interest rate. And if you get no, rid of that, the, the then simple. why would – like there's no real reason to loan anything out unless it really is something that you cannot do. So like half of the shit that's fucking like fueling economic growth right now that's out the window. Like any kind of business, any kind of thing that doesn't require like an insane degree of specialization where it's like nobody but this guy can figure this out. They're not going to get loans anymore. Like the, the, the people with money will just do that shit themselves because they know how to do it. They can figure out how to do it unless it is really something that is so insane. You only got so much time in the like, – yeah, but it's dude, like, dude, dude, like it it, my matter, point is, if it's not something that is insanely specialized in the nature of its innovation, they'll just do it themselves. They'll pay somebody to run it, and they'll just well, directly quality, own it and operate it. That's because we've had a quality plateau, though. We've had a quality plateau. There, you, you, a lot of rich people can't even go above a certain level of quality brand. Like it, it just ends. Like the investment in time in making a particular object has plateaued. Like maybe that shouldn't have happened. You know, maybe that happened just as a byproduct of the industrial era where, you know, we basically decided that the best option is to just mass produce as fast as we can and flood the market. And maybe that's just not the best methodology for for production. And I think uh, let's not conflate production versus like monetary theory, because I think, uh, you know, like production is a required aspect of monetary policy. Right. So if we're still producing things in, you know, strange manners, which basically corrupt the overall macroeconomic system, then like we need to reevaluate production in general. Yeah, I mean, and like, you know, I I really hate to like fucking cut this right here, but like we need to start getting ready for the, the digest, Joe. Uh, like you want to maybe like pick this conversation up afterwards? Yeah, right on. Uh, it was... I. Good for you, Shinobi, for bringing together uh, some some reasonable people. 
That's not me, man. This is all totally a group effort. Right on.